we mostly take for granted that the phrase liberal democracy contains two concepts that belong together. Our next guest has a more complicated view of that. He is Patrick Deneen, professor of political science at the University of Notre Dame and the author of Why Liberalism Failed. And he joins us now from South Bend, Indiana. Professor Deneen, it's good to meet you. How are you doing tonight? Pleasure to be with you. Happy that you're with us. Or Let's... I guess virtually with you. Vir virtually is the best we can do these days and we'll take it, believe me. Uh, I'm going to ask you a sort of a very broad question just to get us started, and I know you could probably give a 25-minute answer to this one question alone, but it's a scene setter. So let's just do a, how would you describe Donald Trump's impact on political culture? Let's start there. Uh, well, I, I think um, you know, Donald Trump it, it was a kind of symptom uh, and an effect of already existing and um, quite quite uh, divisive issues uh, uh, in the United States and I think across the Western world today. Uh, so I think he certainly uh, exacerbated those divisions. Uh, he intensified uh, the sense of uh, dividedness in this nation. But I don't see him as the cause of those divisions and I don't see his uh, departure uh, from office as, as difficult and uh, controversial as it was, as solving or resolving those issues in any really significant way. I think he really uh, was more of a symptom than the disease. No, I take your point on that, but, but I well remember uh, Ronald Reagan's so-called Conservatism, Inc., and what that stood for, and I wonder why, in your view, that view of conservatism has clearly lost to Donald Trump's. Well, I, th I think the reason and, and the argument uh, that I make in, in my book is that what we typically call conservatism, uh, at least in the United States, is really a variant of liberalism. Uh, it's, we might call it classical liberalism, a kind of libertarianism. Uh, and really what we've seen over the last 50 years in the United States is a kind of battle or a contestation between two kinds of liberalism, one that favors a kind of free market economic approach and one that favors the role of the state uh, in ensuring equal liberty. Uh, but as it turns out, this kind of liberalism has not done well or not uh, served well, especially sort of ordinary, uh, typically working class people uh, in, in the kinds of areas I live in, in the heartland of the United States. Uh, and I think so a lot of the divisions weren't just um, and a lot of the reaction against um, that we saw in the in the 2016 and then 2020 election weren't so much uh, kind of the the usual conservatism against liberalism. It was a real rejection of both liberalisms, both conservative liberalism and, and progressive liberalism. And I think that's really the story that tends to be missed when we focus solely on Donald Trump. Well, which is why you have described it thus in your book. This is Know Thyself. Liberalism created the conditions you write and the tools for the ascent of its own worst nightmare yet it lacks the self-knowledge to understand its own culpability. So what are the conditions and the tools that liberalism created that enabled Trump to become president in your view? Well, in interesting ways, Trump, and you mentioned Ronald Reagan earlier, Trump uh, ran in some ways uh, in the first and most important instance against the conservatism of the Reagan era. Uh, we tend to focus on his battle with the progressives and with the media and obviously with Hillary Clinton. Uh, but really the, the, the reason and, the, and the, in some ways the most significant aspect of his candidacy was the way that he overturned the old conservatism of Ronald Reagan, what I described earlier as a kind of liberalism. And if we think of the, the areas that uh, especially Ronald Reagan was foremost uh, in advancing, it was a kind of free market ideology, uh, the beginnings of a, a kind of globalized economy, a financialized economy, the outsourcing of jobs, uh, the, um, the waning of the significance of the manufacturing sector in favor of a financial sector. And it was a very robust and interventionist foreign policy uh, that saw the role of America as advancing liberal democracy in the world. And what really is worth noting is that Donald Trump defeated these two aspects of the Republican Party, of what had been seen as conservatism, uh, in some senses, you could say, um, reflecting, I think, cer certain commitments that might have once been dominant on the left, a kind of uh, more um, uh, 
more interventionist kind of uh, economic policy, uh, one that uh, uh, favored domestic production, uh, but also a, a much more modest kind of foreign policy, one that sought to avoid uh, intervention in foreign uh, wars or to create foreign wars. So I think Donald, Donald Trump, uh, in some senses, was a kind of idiot savant in some ways, a kind of uh, had an intuitive sense of where uh, a significant number of, of voters were in the United States who were not content with either political party. So I think his, his candidacy in some ways wasn't just a rejection of what we see as progressive liberalism, but really in a more fundamental way, it was a rejection of what had been the conservative consensus of the last 50 years. Indeed. I'm going to ask you to comment on one word. And it's a, it's a strange one word because Donald Trump's slogan, of course, was make America great again. And I wouldn't be surprised if 40 years later, people forget the slogan Ronald Reagan ran on, which was, let's make America great again. And I wonder, you know, that word let's invites people to join a movement. Um, is, is there significance in Reagan's having that word and Trump's not having it? I, I actually have not considered that before. Um, it's a good question. Uh, I suppose that there was a, a, a way in which um, people could have interpreted Ronald Reagan's uh, motto. Uh, although, I, honestly, I rem what I remember more of Ronald Reagan's, uh, probably a second campaign, his re-election campaign, was the motto, Morning in America, uh, that, as, the, as the kind of motto. And I, and I think that also evokes that sense that something is being renewed. I, I think it's an old whatever whatever the significance of the uh, of the change of the motto i think it is a kind of significant part of the american ethos or story of itself that there's always a kind of uh there's been a departure from something true about america something that's um uh at its heart uh is has been lost and needs to be restored i mean this is you know it goes back to the civil war you know uh, uh, i'm sorry uh, abraham lincoln didn't run on sort of let, let's overturn uh, what America is. He ran on a kind of campaign of let's restore the principles of the American founding. So I, I, I think beyond the change of the words, I think the significance is that Donald Trump tapped into a very old American narrative of a kind of restoration of something that had been lost. Let's do another excerpt from your book here. And we'll ask our switcher, Tony, Burke to bring this up and everybody can read along at home. Liberalism, you write, has failed because liberalism has succeeded. As it becomes fully itself, it generates endemic pathologies more rapidly and pervasively than it is able to produce band-aids and veils to cover them. The result is the systemic rolling blackouts in electoral politics, governance, and economics, the loss of confidence, and even belief and legitimacy among citizenry that accumulated not as separable and discrete problems to be solved within the liberal frame, but as a deeply interconnected crisis of legitimacy and a portent of liberalism's end times. The problem is not in just one program or application, but in the operating system itself. All right, let's dive into that. What is fundamentally wrong with liberalism's operating system? Well, I guess to get uh, momentarily a little historical and philosophical, Liberalism was, uh, was created uh, you know, roughly 500 years ago as a philosophical movement uh, with the idea being a, uh, a way of organizing our politics that would allow people to live in peace with each other uh, regardless of their deeply held beliefs and commitments, often seen as arising from the wars of religion, and that liberalism would be a kind of neutral order that would allow people to live freely under their own lights, uh, whether as parts of religious traditions, as non-believers, as non-conformists, uh, as people with deep and, and abiding faith or uh, various beliefs. Uh, in, in that sense, it seemed to be a proposal of a system in which the government had and the, and the state itself had no preference, uh, didn't have a kind of say in the matter of, of of what the end of the game should be. It was just acted as a referee to make sure that everyone played by the rules of the game. Don't enforce your beliefs on someone else. But as liberalism's own internal logic proceeds, uh, its core principle is the liberation of people from any unchosen identities. Uh, that one should not only be free to pursue one's own beliefs and to live according to one's own lights, uh, 
but the imposition of views, the imposition of a belief system, uh, becomes to be seen as potentially shaping or forming every aspect of life. And so family life, religious life, uh, um, the kinds of uh, the places we happen to be born into, these, these all have to be sort of revised and revisited as potential forms of oppression. And so liberalism ultimately becomes a kind of authoritarian or attends in an authoritarian direction in kind of arranging a society that uh, you could say to use Rousseau's phrase, forces us to be free. Uh, that sees great threats coming from any limitations on our choice of identity. And, and I think one of the aspects that we're seeing today is the way in which the liberal order itself is increasingly aggressive and even kind of authoritarian when it comes uh, to more traditional beliefs and traditional believers and practices. So it's no longer um, has lays a claim to being in some senses neutral or not having a, a dog in the fight of the kind of life we should be leading. We see increasingly a kind of state mandated form of life uh, that I think is, is creating deep divisions uh, across the West and certainly in the United States. It's interesting to me that you use authoritarianism, that word, in this context, because of course uh, there are many people, I think mostly from the progressive side of the political spectrum, who think that Donald Trump is the most authoritarian president of their lifetime, and if anybody ought to have the authoritarian tag put onto him, it's certainly not liberals, it is him. Could you speak to that? Well, sure. I, I think um, in some ways the it seems like the the, the core, or the back, background belief is that one can live in a world without authority. Uh, we certainly know that's not the case. There's always going to be a, 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 a statement or a stance uh, regarding what should be authoritative in a society. Uh, and I think that that uh, uh, from the standpoint of those uh, of those kinds of more traditional beliefs, religious beliefs, for example, uh, such people would regard uh, both. Past, past presidents uh, under President Obama and policies under the current uh, president, President Biden, as quite authoritative uh, and even reaching the point of authoritarianism uh, that uh, uh, mandates about health care, mandates about um, uh, how one should uh, uh, organize one's uh, religious uh, institutions or how one should express one's religious beliefs in public. Uh, but even beyond the state, of course, we're seeing increasingly uh, very deep forms and pervasive forms of a kind of authoritarianism in what is supposedly the private parts of life, especially from corporations, the use of corporate power, especially technology companies, uh, their extraordinary economic power uh, to enforce a kind of set of norms uh, that increasingly hew to uh, a kind of liberal, liberal progressive worldview. Uh, so I, I, I suppose that's the case that one, one is always going to confront expressions of uh, and forms of authority, which if one is subject to those forms of authority, one will regard as authoritarian. My point is really just that liberal order claims, it states explicitly that it is indifferent to the questions or ends or the purposes of life. But in fact, it has an authoritative set of principles that it endorses. And when I suggest that liberalism is in a kind of crisis, it's precisely because great many people uh, don't actually agree to those forms of authoritative uh, um, values and norms that today are becoming quite plain and visible in liberal states and liberal nations. Well, let's find out where that puts us today, because if Reagan-style conservatism, conservatism, Inc., is demolished, and if the liberal operating system that you've referenced is also gone, is there a new and different operating system that you think we should welcome? Well, I think right now we're in a uh, we're in a, a great, obviously very titanic uh, battle uh, that in which you see it's interesting you say Reaganism has died. I think Reaganism has moved in some senses to the left. Uh, you saw in the last election, the 2020 election, people who had formerly been self-described conservatives like Bill Kristol, uh, who used to be a voice, uh, you know, sort of one of the public voices of conservatism, ran the founded and ran the the journal the Weekly Standard. Uh, moved decisively uh, on the side of the Democrats, uh, precisely because the Democratic Party is increasingly the party of a kind of consolidated liberalism uh, on both uh, the kind of, uh, obviously, the, the uh, social issues, but increasingly also um, certain kinds of uh, 
economic issues, uh, an endorsement of globalization uh, to a considerable extent, to the point that someone like Bill Kristol sees more um, uh, sort of sympathetic, uh, his views are more simpatico uh, on the political left today. So I wouldn't say that Reaganism has died. I'd simply say that it, what we're seeing is a kind of realignment. Instead, what you're seeing is an alignment of what had been formerly, um, I think, more left economics, a kind of more nationalist economics, which used to be the economics of the Democratic Party, protecting uh, manufacturing, uh, the working class, uh, those uh, with uh, lower skilled jobs, uh, as opposed to the kind of laptop class that has moved increasingly to the progressive side, uh, but in a, an alignment of a, of a kind of economically left uh, and a more socially right um, uh, perspective. Uh, I think you see the rising number of Hispanics voting for Republicans, which we just saw in a recent local election in Texas, which is surprising many people, that reflects this kind of realignment. So I think what you're going to increasingly see uh, in the United States and across the West is a kind of consolidated party of liberalism, of both right and left, formerly right and left liberalism that used to be the divide, the political divide in the United States and much of the West, uh, increasingly consolidated into one party and its opposition becoming a kind of anti-liberal party. And I don't mean that uh, as if it's uh, some great uh, boogeyman or something which should cause great fear. It combines a kind of um, a more um, interventionist and uh, welfare um, uh, families oriented uh, kind of uh, welfare state uh, with a fairly more, I would say a more conservative um, forms of social um, policy. And, uh, uh, and I think the economic uh, forms of support, especially for families, would coincide with that more kind of family value oriented approach in the social issues. Let me ask you about the current president. He obviously has a, a huge spending program that he has proposed right now in the order of trillions of dollars. It is much bigger government. It is much more involved in people's lives, or it would hope to be. If it proves ultimately to be successful, would that, in your view, do the trick of giving liberalism and new lease on life? I, I, I think that uh, uh, it's interesting. The, uh, I, I actually think the, uh, the, what, you're, what you're discussing as the, uh, the constituency that supported Donald Trump were actually quite supportive of a, of a um, infrastructure bill of public spending along those lines. And it comports with what I was suggesting earlier uh, as the uh, growing uh, let's say, um, a, a growing uh, a sense of acceptability of, of government programs, of government expenditures by those on the political right. Uh, that again, I think uh, was uh, certainly not part of the Reagan era understanding of conservatism. So I, I think that in some ways you could say it would be potentially a, a something supported across the aisle, whether it's uh, whether it's actually supported by today's Republican congressman, I do think you'd see widespread support for it among, broadly speaking, the working class, those who might benefit a great deal from the kinds of jobs that would be produced. I think the, um, the question is going to be whether the particular blend of kind of stimulative economic policy uh, oriented to such things as infrastructure combined with the kind of woke progressive policies that you see being embraced by the Biden administration, whether this will be sufficiently appealing to a kind of broad swath of kind of middle America that I think uh, Joe Biden in his heart clearly wants to appeal to. Uh, it's the tradition from which he comes. Uh, it's broadly uh, the people with whom he identifies with having grown up. But the party has clearly changed. Uh, his party has clearly changed. And so I think he's in many ways outsourcing those kinds of concerns and policies. He speaks to them, but the kinds of policies that we're gonna see advanced by Equal Opportunity Commission, uh, Equal Opportunity Employment Commission, the, uh, the various judicial activities of the Department of Justice and so forth, I think are gonna to prove to be off-putting to a great many uh, voters in the, in the midterm election and in the, uh, in the uh, subsequent presidential election in several years. So whether uh, a kind of stimulative economic policy will be sufficient to overcome what I think will be a, 
a great distaste uh, for the more sort of woke progressive types of policies. It's, I think that's an interesting question. And I think that's the gamble that, that Joe Biden is taking with this administration. Well, let me follow up with what is admittedly a bit of a chippy question here. And that is, I mean, you, you are a serious guy. You teach at a world-class post-secondary institution. You're a committed Christian as well. The man who represents conservatism in your country today is an ill-tempered, vain, uncurious, ill-read. I could go on. I mean, he's a pretty disgraceful guy. 58% of Republicans today believe that Donald Trump is still the legitimate president of the United States of America. How do you feel about all that? Well, I, I was not a particular personally, I think your question is to me personally, I was not personally a particular fan of Donald Trump. Uh, I'm not to this day a fan of Donald Trump. And as I began uh, by saying, I, I think it's important to understand and view Donald Trump uh, again, as a kind of symptom of a, of a deep dis-ease uh, in the American body politic, uh, that a significant number of American citizens had grown so discontent with the political offerings on both the right and the left that they were willing uh, to put into office a man, as you've described, of ill temper and bad judgment and, uh, you know, psychotic personality uh, precisely to break uh, what they saw as a corrupt system on both the left and the right. Uh, that the candidates who uh, would come, ask for their votes, promise certain things, uh, but then in a succession of elections, whether it was Republican or Democrat, uh, proceeded to undo every aspect of life that they held dear, uh, whether it was in the economic sphere or in the social sphere whether it was shipping off their jobs or undermining the kinds of social values that they saw as essential uh, to living full, decent, uh, and flourishing lives. So I see the election of Donald Trump and, and the ongoing support for him as a sign of the pathologies, not uh, of, the, of the people per se who supported him, but of a political system that made him the best option and the most attractive mm -hmm. option to people. No, I would I like that, that to be, I would like that to be the focus. I think the more we focus on the personality of Donald Trump, the more we are avoiding, uh, and it seems to me willfully avoiding the kind of analysis we need to undertake to really understand the political currents that are at play. And I think they go well beyond Donald Trump and they will be with us after Donald Trump is a, is, you know, a bad memory in the mind of many. And I, I would prefer to, to make uh, the, the focus those political conditions that led to the rise of someone so ill-suited to the office, but nevertheless revealing the illness and the pathologies of our political order. You know, well said and totally fair point. I got 10 seconds left to ask you about the fact that Barack Obama said the other day he's read your book and really liked it. What'd you make of that? I take it as a high compliment uh, that someone uh, as intelligent as Barack Obama can read someone with whom he probably disagrees, but nevertheless find value in, in those works uh, or in those words. And I, as someone, as an intellectual, someone who reads widely, uh, I hope to do the same. Uh, I'm not doctrinaire in what I, what I believe per se, uh, but I think we need to confront and think about those with whom we might disagree uh, to come to a deeper understanding of where we are today. And I appreciate your having me on uh, to do precisely that. A delight to have you. Patrick J. Deneen, Why Liberalism Failed. He joined us from South Bend, Indiana at the University of Notre Dame. Thanks so much, Patrick. My pleasure. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.